Welcome to Transform with me, Greg Carson. This podcast explores the transformation of market ecosystems and the people behind this transformation. Um, as a reminder, uh, the views and opinions expressed by me or my guests are, are our own and do not represent the views of Humble Ventures or their companies or their, their companies. Uh, the content provided in this podcast are for informational and educational purposes only. It's not intended to be financial advice. The hosts um, the hosts and guests are not here speaking as financial advisors, and any decisions you make are based on the information in this podcast or your own risk. Before making those financial decisions, consult with a qualified professional. Um, the producers of Transform are not responsible for loss of damages related to um, stuff that you might do based on this. Thank you. So um, we have a guest, uh, Hasib Qureshi. I hope I pronounce his name right um is uh Hasib Qureshi is the managing director at dragon uh, managing partner at dragonfly a global cryptocurrency investment firm that bridges the gap between east and west and the digital asset space um with a rich background in both technology and finance Hasib is a leading voice in the world of crypto and decentralized finance um before joining dragonfly he was a renowned engineer and entrepreneur working as a software engineer at airbnb and as a general partner at metastable capital Today, Hasib will be sharing his insights on upcoming transformations in the financial markets and uh, integration of cryptocurrencies and blockchain and um, and what institutional investors and family offices might need to know to stay ahead in this rapidly changing uh, environment. Um, with that, I welcome uh, Hasib to the show. Um, welcome, Hasib. Thanks for having me, Greg. Great to be here. Um, I guess the, the first thing, maybe you want to just uh, give a little introduction. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So as you mentioned, um, I'm managing partner at Dragonfly. Uh, I've been uh, running this fund alongside my partner, Bo, for a little bit over six years now. So wow. Dragonfly, we're a multi-billion dollar uh, venture fund. We manage uh, several funds. We're just coming up on to, uh, we raised our third fund a few years ago. We're just now in the process of putting together our, our fourth fund. Uh, we are about 45 people around the world today, uh, based in Singapore, Hong Kong, West Coast, East Coast, US, and Western Europe. So very global team. Uh, and mm -hmm. we're, we're known in the crypto space for being one of the most active, earliest, and highest conviction investors in many of the projects that have staked out new claims or new territories within the mm -hmm. landscape of blockchain and cryptocurrency. So. That's uh, that's what I do. That's what I spend my time on. Uh, and uh, you know, as you mentioned before, that I, I come from the world of software engineering and tech. And way before any of that, I used to be a professional poker player, which mm -hmm. I took it from some of the questions you flashed me earlier that we'll probably be talking about at some point. Um, so I come. <laughs> I, I have a very I uh, a, a varied background that I bring into the investing world, which I think informs a lot of my thinking and perspective in a way that is different from many of the other people who. Uh, find themselves investing in the crypto landscape. Uh, the thing that's great about crypto is that it is, um, it's very novel and it demands very first principles thinking in order to, to really understand what this new technology and this new landscape is going to evolve into. Mm. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think it attracts people who come from very different walks of life and have the ability to think flexibly uh, and aren't, aren't in some sense, um, uh, mired in the assumptions of how things are supposed to play out, but instead right. are able to, you know, uh, think, pay attention and just learn from what crypto and blockchain are teaching us about how this technology is going to play out. Mm -hmm. I get, yeah. I mean, so I like the word he says, how things are supposed to play out. I was, um, what do you think? I, I guess the, let's just start with the, that poker player question that I was, uh, you saw, I guess, already that uh, that it was an interesting background of mine. It seems to be a theme. I did have one other guest that has a poker background, so uh, mm. I and I do notice there's a lot of poker players in our space. Um, yeah. Take us through that journey. Just start. Like, how did you get into being a professional poker player, 
And then how did po professional poker playing end? And then obviously there's a couple more things. And then you became a partner at, at uh, Dragonfly and, and the, the, the origin story, like the Batman origin story of Hasid. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, so I started playing poker when I was 16 years old. Uh, before that, I'd actually, I'd never gambled, never knew anything about cards or casinos or any of that stuff. Um, I'd, I'd enter college uh, at an early age, actually at the age of 15, I started college. And uh, wow. at the time, I thought I wanted to go into math, science, something or other, um, and found myself very quickly disillusioned with all of that. Um, and so I, I was playing cards with some friends of mine, uh, and I realized I, I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, they invited me to play a poker game. I didn't know what checking or betting or folding or turns or rivers or any of this stuff, all completely alien to me. You know, mm -hmm. I played cards with my cousins every once in a while, but never, never really poker and, and never gambling with chips. Um, mm -hmm. And so I remember I was, I was so embarrassed that I very quickly lost all my money. Um, and I went back to my room and I was like, okay, I need to learn how to play poker because I, like, I, I look like a joke to my friends. Um, you don't want to and lose. So I, 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 of course not. Who wants to lose? <laughs> so I, uh, I went online. I started reading a bunch of articles about poker. And one of these articles I came across described this, um, this new wave of online poker players who were in college, they were very young guys, uh, mostly guys, mm -hmm. and they were using mathematics and game theory uh, to, to discover a new way of playing poker that was beating mm. a lot of the old guard, a lot of the newer generation of poker players. And oh, really? I read this and I thought to myself, I bet I could do that. Like, that sounds, that sounds cool, um, but that also sounds doable. I think I'm a smart guy. Uh, and so I decided that I was going to try to learn how to play poker like these new generation of poker players. Um, and so I remember, yeah, again, at that time I was underage, obviously. So uh, I, I was learning a little bit of poker and I called up my older brother, who at the time was 18 years old. And I told him, hey, man, uh, I have been learning a little bit about poker. I think I, I'm starting to get this, you know, I'm playing in the play money games. Uh, I think I might be able to do this. Can you lend me $50 so that I can start playing poker? And he was like, what? You're gambling? What are you doing? Like, you should be in school. Like, don't tell our parents <laughs> about this. Never, you know, never. I was just like, oh, screw you. <laughs> Whatever. You suck. Uh, and so I was like, okay, I got to find some way to launch myself as a poker player. Um, and so I went to uh, this. There was this website at the time called Party Poker, which is one of the biggest poker sites out there. And mm -hmm. they had this promotion where if you scanned in your driver's license, they would give you $50 for free to start gambling. Now, I didn't have a driver's license. Uh, and so this was the early days of Google image search. And so I went on Google and I found the first image I could that wasn't blurred of a driver's license, which was <laughs> some little old lady from Maryland. And I sent in her driver's license. And that was how I created my first account. And that was the only money I ever deposited into or deposit, quote unquote, deposited. Um, right, right. Fifty dollars that I had from this lady in Maryland, and that's how I started my poker career. So Does I she know she has such a big poker career? Does she know that? She, uh, she, I, I, <laughs> I never got in contact with her. Thankfully, she's probably grateful for that. Um, but uh, I started playing. I mean, I only had fifty dollars, right? I know, I know, way to deposit again, and so I, I had to grind my way up playing the five cent, ten cent games, then the ten cent, twenty five cent games. And so, you know, stake by stake, slowly kind of building my bankroll um, until by, you know, I, I started with $50. By the end of the summer, I turned that into $2,000. By nice. the fall, I turned that into 20000 And by the end of the first year, I made $100,000. And uh, it was then that I decided, hey, I think this is, I think I'm good enough at this that maybe I should take this seriously. And yeah consider this like, hey, maybe I should be a professional poker player. And so um, and you, you, know, you may have you may have spent some time uh, not in classes doing poker in that That's year. Right. <laughs> my, my grades <laughs> are awful. Uh, as soon as I discovered <laughs> poker, my grades, you know, went out the window. Um, and so I, you know, I ended up dropping out of school eventually uh, and focused on playing poker full time. I was sponsored. I, I traveled around the world. Um, and so it was it was a very, you know, learning at the seat of uh, you know, gambling and, and playing this game of, of poker um, teaches you a tremendous amount about yourself, managing your own psychology, uh, a tremendous amount about risk, 
about probability, about uncertainty, mm. about psychology, human psychology, yeah. not just your own, but other people's. Um, all of this stuff ended up becoming very important as I would later find myself uh, in the investing world because in, in some sense, uh, yeah, I was, I was actually talking with somebody yesterday who was asking me about, you know, whether poker, uh, you know, it's like a, whether it's like a sport um, or whether it's like tennis or chess or one of these things. And I'm like, oh, kind of, kind of, but in a way, you know, if you think of the, the dichotomy between art and science, I would say, um, you know, some, a game like chess is much more of a science relative to something yeah, like it's poker. Just um, there's no chance at all in chess. That's the one, the defining factor. Exactly. There's exactly. no, there's, there's zero no chance. Yeah, there's, there's, there's no, chance. there's, there's nothing that can happen that's not done by the players. Exactly. Whereas poker is fundamentally uncertain. It's full of lying uh, and, and high stakes and fear and, um, you know, you ultimately being demanded to control yourself in order to win yeah. at this game. And in that, in that way, it's much more analogous to business. And it's much more of an artistic game, I think, than mm. most of the other games that, that people participate in. Uh, and that's why I think it's, it's really an unparalleled uh, education that prepares yeah. you for investing uh, or for any other type of enterprise which requires you to take risk and to think fluidly about probabilities and, and uncertainty. So uh, poker for me was a tremendous um, teacher that I ended up taking a lot away from me. So I, I played poker professionally for about five years. Um, I was ranked one of the top 10 online no but hold mm -hmm. players in the world by the time I was 19. Uh, mm -hmm. And I ended up leaving the game under much less auspicious circumstances. So um, when I was uh, in, in the very last year, when I was 21, this is right around the time that uh, the Department of Justice ended up going after a lot of these overseas poker sites. Uh, because yeah. they were offering services to Americans like myself, which they weren't supposed to be because online gambling at that time was not widely um, allowed Accepted. Uh, by yeah. U.S. states, right? And so uh, eventually that would change in the 2010s. But uh, at that time, it was still, you know, very, very few states allowed online gambling. But most of these overseas poker sites uh, encouraged basically any American to deposit money uh, using these like really weird ways that they weren't supposed to be doing. Or so, ladies in Boston's IDs. Oh, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so, um, so at, at that time, actually, um, you know, I was I was well known as a uh, professional poker player, and there was this there was this uh, kid um, who uh, was known as this uh, uh, prodigy, uh, very young very young kid who myself and a buddy of mine uh, were mentoring and tutoring, and that kid ended up cheating a bunch of people. Oh and, wow! Um, me and uh, my my. Uh, me and my me and my colleague who were both backing that kid um we ended up uh I, I wouldn't say defending him but trying to protect him from the consequences of him cheating and as a result of that we were um painted with the same brush or or okay. accused of potentially being in cahoots with him in his cheating and so which which wasn't true but we um we we basically he was a very young kid he was you know 19 years old at the time and mm -hmm. uh as a result of that, as a result of my affiliation with this this kid, um, w both myself and uh, the the guy who were uh, who we both protected him, um, we ended up really having a lot of our names dragged through the mud in the poker community, um, which was you know at the time I was I was very young I was you know twenty one uh, mm -hmm. I didn't have a lot of life experience and the feeling of having my own reputation uh, damaged by you know this uh, th this this decision that i made and this person who i was affiliating with um really really changed my perspective on what i was doing with my life and mm. the kind of person who i wanted to be and so uh i ended up so th this was right after what was called black friday which was when the department of justice came in and shut down a lot of these uh, off overseas poker sites and most mm -hmm. of the poker players who i knew at that time basically had to move outside the US if they wanted to continue playing in the biggest games yep. in poker. And mm -hmm. I was at a, a junction in my life that decided, do I want to keep doing this basically for the rest of my life? Do I want to continue to be a professional poker player or do I want to start over and find, you know, what is the second or third chapter of my life going to be uh, that if, if it's not going to be poker? 
And most of the people who I knew who are poker players, a lot of them are still poker players. A lot right. of them you know, are, are, are doing this into their 30s and into their 40s and they never let go of the game because poker, if you're very, very good at it, it's easy money. It's yeah. the easiest thing you could possibly do to make that amount of money and, and have that amount of prestige among people you know. Um, mm -hmm. And for me, it was something that I always knew about myself that I didn't want to play cards the rest of my life. Mm. I wanted to do something more useful for society. Um, more useful. So I decided more useful, ideally. I mean, t TBD, whether, whether crypto is that, uh, but- uh, no, but like, I, I, let's, I, let's go back to the Eve of 21. Like what, yeah. what was in your mind then? Like, uh, okay, so I'm gonna give up cards what is my purpose? Like, what is the Hasib? What, what did you think your purpose was? What is it that you thought you were going to go towards? I mean, candidly, I had no idea. Okay. Um, you just knew it wasn't cards. I, I want to do something more purposeful. I knew, it, I knew it wasn't cards. And I knew in some sense that the fact that it was very difficult for me to quit poker playing at the highest levels and having, you know, again, I grew up around poker players, right? From 16 to 21, those are the only people I spent time with. And they were, and you had become a you're, you're kind of at the top, right? And and these people, they respected me. They look up to me. I, I helped a lot of people. I taught a lot of people. I was an educator. Uh, I made these instructional videos. I wrote. Um, I, was, I was very very active in the community. And, and in some sense, this was everything that I had spent my adult life up to that time cultivating. And right. now, if I if I quit poker, I was a college dropout with no <laughs> skills, uh, with just a little bit of money. Uh, just wandering around the world with nothing valuable to give to anyone. And it was, it was uh -huh. very, very psychologically challenging phase of my life. Um, yeah. But I'm very, very glad that I did it. I look back at a lot of those people who I knew at the time who are still poker players. And um, it's, a, it's, a very tough, it's a very tough life and it's one that doesn't imbue one with a lot of meaning. And that's something I always felt when I was a poker player, um, mm -hmm. but never more acutely than... Um, than after I left it and realizing okay. um, how little, in, in a way, poker is a, it, it's a very selfish activity, right? Because fundamentally yeah. you sit down at a poker player. It's, it's both selfish and in a deep sense lonely because you sit down mm. at a poker table, it doesn't matter how many friends you have who are poker players. When you sit down at a poker table, there is only one person on your team. And that is right. everybody else at the poker table is out to get you and you are out to get them. Right. And on some right. level, um, you know, there can be some camaraderie off the table um, but everybody knows that, you know, th there's, there's this uh, famous, uh, quip in poker, um, is that, you know, poker, it's very tough psychologically because you go through these big downswings and you go through upswings. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of volatility. Um, and the saying is that, uh, everybody who understands doesn't care and everybody who cares doesn't understand. So, <laughs> you know, your, uh, your, your parents, oh, you know, they might, they might hear about these big downswings. They're like, oh my God, oh, that's so terrible. I can't believe that, you know, you should stop playing. This is, this is so awful for you. It's like, no, 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 this is normal. It happens. It's like, this is not helping for you to get anxious and scared about what's a normal downswing. Um, and the people who do understand the other poker players, they're like, dude, shut up. Okay. Like, I'm going through my own downswing. Like, you know, I look, I, yeah, I get it. This stuff's hard, <laughs> it's hard for all of us. Um, and so it, it, it's, it's, it is an enormously challenging environment in which to bear this kind of volatility and stress. Um, yeah. The interesting thing about venture, in a way, um, poker is more similar to trading, I would say. In, yes, in trading, would... you're making a lot of small decisions. You get very quick feedback loops of whether you made the right decision or the wrong decision. Um, and a trading, you know, for, for a lot of people who are trading, it's tremendously solitary, right? It's, a, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's not a team sport. Um, yeah, even if you're on a team, said, you're making, you get called for your own book. Like you, you know, you exactly. made that trade. You have your, somebody PNL, made every right? trade. Yeah, there's your PNL. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, especially today, July, July 5th on a, on a, on a big day. <laughs> that's right. Trading that's right. That's right. Uh, and so venture is very different, right? Venture is a team yeah. sport fundamentally, and it's also fundamentally a positive sum game. So when you are, uh, investing with a founder. You win if they win. You yes. win if there's a company that creates a useful product that other people value, that has employees and partners and customers and users or whatever it is. Uh, and in, in some sense, you win through this kind of pro-social creation of value. And that, in, in, in some sense, it's very different than trading and yeah. very different from poker in that sense. Um, and, I, yeah. and, I, and I find it's very, very psychologically salutary 
to have that kind of positive um, value creation sitting at the heart of the activity that you're engaged in. Um, so it's, one thing that I, I find I, it, it's, it's kind of meaning, it's meaning, it's a meaning, it's an, it's a meaning based profession. There's meaning okay. to it. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. If you're doing it well. Yeah. Well, I mean, especially if you're doing it well, but I think there's, you know, sometimes the CEOs in the in industry give this, you know, this, they have different quibs about venture capitalists and, and blah, blah, blah. Um, but at the, most of the venture capitalists I know, and it sounds like you as well, and obviously I, I, I've done a lot of venture investing as well, you know, I like it because it's the, at the very heart of it, you are creating and you're helping and you're actually right. generating the future at the moment. Is that, I mean, is that how you feel about it? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the, the amount of agency that uh, I've, I've learned as a venture capital you can have in influencing the outcomes for some of these founders, not, not for all of them, certainly. And ultimately, mm -hmm. as a venture capitalist, you play a relatively small role in the journey of a founder to get to where yes. they're going to go. But there are these moments where a founder comes to you in a moment of crisis, or there's some big strategic decision that needs to get made, and you can be that pivotal voice in helping nudge them in the right direction, helping them win yep, that yep. critical partnership, helping them, you know, whatever it is, um, it is really special to be able to play that part of being a trusted advisor um, mm -hmm. or a, a, you know, a, a, a supporter in yeah. somebody's journey. And you know, one, one thing I've, I've realized um, relatively early in my career as a venture capitalist is that VCs have magic powers when it comes to influencing founders. And this is something that didn't occur to me for a very long time. And it's something I very often see in junior VCs, takes them a while to understand the magic power they have now acquired now that they've become VCs, right? So mm -hmm. the, the thing is, when, when you're talking to a founder, many founders, uh, almost by their nature, have blinders on to certain things that yeah. are happening within their company, within their strategy, within you know, whatever it is that they're doing. Um, yeah, yeah. And it, it's very often something that's obvious to everybody around them, right? So for example, there's sometimes that a founder uh, is, is committing themselves to a marketing strategy for a product. And that marketing strategy is bad. It's not gonna work. It's too- And everybody knows. On the nose, it's corny, and everybody knows. And somehow, nobody around them can quite tell them, right? Everybody's a little bit too scared, or maybe they're trying to be sensitive, or maybe they're like, oh, well, maybe the founder knows something I don't. You know, who am I to tell them they're such a successful person? Um, you know, maybe I should just bite my tongue and like, you know, I'm not a marketing genius, and this guy obviously is, so I should just listen to them. Um, and the one thing, the one person who is in a privileged position to just be able to just say whatever they think without a filter is the VC. Yeah. And so there's so many times in my experience where I found like, you know, have you, have you, like, this is kind of a stupid campaign. Uh, I, think it's kind of dumb. <laughs> like, I don't think it's a good idea. And they'll hear that and they'll be like, wow, nobody has told me that. that <laughs> really? And I'm like, what? Nobody told you? How could nobody have told you this? This is so obviously wrong. You should do this instead. And they're just like, Oh my God, thank you, Asid. That's so amazing. I'm going to go back and talk to people about this. And this kind of thing happens so often that yeah. I've just learned there's something about being outside the, you know, the, the, the gravitational force field of a yes. founder that they exert yeah. on everybody around them that gives you this ability to actually have um, outsized influence in many critical decisions. Not because you're smarter than everybody else, not because you are, you have some unique insight, but simply because you're outside of that power structure of yeah. being inside, you know, uh, well, the, um, they also haven't paid you. Like you're not, you're not, you're not right. hired by them. So there's a big difference. Cause obviously I, I came from strategy consulting and then shifted mm -hmm. to investment banking and then in venture. And the huge difference that you have, like I see, I see, I mean, like you're, you're obviously a legend in the space is like, okay, well, it's not like they've convinced you uh, that you've convinced them to hire you. You know, you've given them your cash. You're an investor. You're, you're, the metaphor of investment is is like pure there, so it actually changes the cognitive dissonance when they hear stuff from you. I think quite a bit. Look, that, that's definitely true, and it's it's also true as I've advanced in my career and gained some credibility in the industry. But the thing yeah. that I'm pointing to is something that I think, I think I, I had that almost immediately yes. after becoming a VC, and I think actually even junior VCs have this, which okay. is something that they never appreciate which is that right. founders tend to believe 
that VCs see the entire matrix, right? They sit outside okay. of it and they can see all the startups. They see what works. They see what doesn't. And for some reason, they just believe that VCs know something very deep that founders don't or that industry participants don't, which is not necessarily true. It's sometimes true. And it's true about some things. Don't worry, I'll, I'll go and edit this out so nobody hears that part of you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's just simply true that um, yeah, yeah, yeah. just because I think, you know, I, I, it, was, it was basically within the first year that I noticed uh, that I became, as a junior VC, that I noticed people would just take my advice on huge decisions. Yeah. And I was like, I, I have no insight. I don't know. I know nothing. I like, I just <laughs> showed up here. Why are you listening to me? Right. You're like the super impressive founder. You've built all these like amazing multi-billion dollar things. Um, why would you think that I know what I'm talking about? And the answer, like it, it gradually started to dawn on me why this dynamic exists. And why? it's something that I, I, it's, it is just this thing that you are sitting outside of the game. You are on the outside, like the referee calling balls and strikes. And for some reason, yeah. like there are other people in the company, there are other people around them, they're friends, you know, there, there are other advisors who, who also can see the same thing you can see. The power of a VC is that because you sit outside of that game, um, you can just say what you think. No yep. filters, no, no, like trying to massage it into a certain way. You can just, you have the power to say what you think. And everybody around that founder is not allowed to say what they think. It's <laughs> true. And, and that is, in, in some sense, that is what is most valuable about great uh, uh, partners to a founder, great employees, right. great executives, is that mm -hmm. you know, if somebody is confident enough and empowered enough and capable enough, a lot of the value of, of building companies is in just really saying what you think. So many times I see these companies that are going off the rails or making big strategic errors, and many people at the company know that it's a mistake. And nobody quite knows how to say the right thing to get the train back on the tracks you know so so often this happens um and uh, and and people see it right you you see these companies on twitter making big gigantic uh mistakes and yeah. you're like how did nobody at that company know that this was stupid and right. the answer is probably a bunch of people did know that it was stupid right but they weren't able to say it they weren't empowered or there was some fear or there was some sense that maybe we did, I thought we already told the founder that this is a bad idea, but he wants to do it anyway, but nobody quite had the, the, the gravity to be able to communicate that in such a clear, crisp way that the investors are often able to. Yeah. Well, they, and they may have, they may have actually said something, but they're not outside the game. So exactly. he doesn't, he, he or she doesn't hear it the same way exactly. or it doesn't land the same way, you know? So, right. Why it's good. So, and I guess in that vein, what are some of the big pivots that you've seen happen? I mean, you've obviously been involved with a number of, of you know, fantastic uh, journeys in the space. Um, and, and, and I would say the space has tremendous meaning. That's why I call the podcast transform. Um, right. You know, is, is I think, I think we're seeing a transformation of the world and it's not just the world, but all the people involved. So, the, the, the name is a, a deep thing. So I see what you see and, I, and I'd like to, you know, I tell you that I think, you know, there, there is tremendous meaning in, in both our space and your and the venture capital business. So tell me like, what are kind of like, let's tell me one or two, just tell me one of the, the, these big decisions that came in the past where like something, they were going in one direction and you had, you kind of talked to them into changing a different direction and that, and now they're, they're, they're somewhere that everyone's noticed. Um, so one company that comes to mind, uh, a company I sit on the board of is a company called Bloxroute. So Bloxroute, um, way back in the day, Bloxroute was a company that uh, you, you can think of as just a, a networking company for, for blockchains. So it allows blockchains okay. to propagate messages and, and blocks and transactions as fast as humanly possible using a mesh network that overlays the public internet. So normally okay. in a blockchain, when you're transmitting information, you're transmitting it over this peer-to-peer -peer network. Right. So you're okay. just, you know, uh, these messages are slowly propagating through the Internet, going from person to person uh, until they end up saturating the entire network. And the problem with mm -hmm. doing that is that that's kind of slow. So mm. if you're doing this normal peer to peer propagation, messages kind of take their time. They sort of get handed off. It's like a, it's like a relay race where it goes from one person to the next person, to the next person. And as a result, it takes you know multiple seconds for a single transaction to propagate across the entire uh, globe. And this is 
you know, fine if you're Bitcoin and you have 10 minute blocks and, you know, you can be kind of leisurely at the pace at which you're propagating messages. Um, but if you're looking at one of these modern blockchains that transmit messages much more quickly than, mm -hmm. uh, and they have a much faster block time, right? Ethereum, 12 seconds or Solana, you know, 400, 500 milliseconds. Um, th these, these newer generation blockchains, they demand much lower latency and much higher transaction throughput. And so Blockrout in there being, you know, these guys are networking experts. They're very, very, uh, 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 they're very, very advanced networking stack that allows these messages to propagate very, very quickly for, across mm -hmm. miners or validators. Um, mm -hmm. This ends up becoming much more valuable in a proof of stake driven world, which is the world we live in today, where most blockchains are not like Bitcoin and don't have very, very high latency block times. Okay, so at the time that I met this company, and I know I know this company for quite a while, um, at the time that I met them, they thought that their business was taking uh, you know these this peer-to-peer -peer messaging speed and offering a service to customers, to, to users, to allow right. them to have their transactions propagate faster in exchange for a small fee. And hmm. this is a stupid business. This is a terrible business. This, you're not going to make any money <laughs> charging users. The next sentence. <laughs> yeah, charging users a very tiny amount of money to have their transactions propagate slightly faster. Like nobody will pay for that. Nobody has any idea why they would pay for that. Why do I care about that? Like I'm going to get in the same block anyway. Who cares? And as yeah. a result, they had never made any money ever. <laughs> at the point at which I'd met this company, and they were multi—you know—they were multi years old. Now they had great networking infrastructure. They had a fantastic uh, um, technology stack, but they just did not understand who was going to pay for this, who was their customer. And yeah. um, and I sat down with them uh, at the time that you know before I ended up leading their Series A, and explained to them, guys, you, what you've built is an amazing product. You guys have fantastic abilities as technologists and as engineers. Um, but you do not understand who your customer is. This is not your customer. Your customer is trading firms. That is who cares about super low latency and being able to see what's happening within the mempool or within the next block very quickly. And the reason why they care about it is MEV. Yeah. And they had never, I mean, nobody had ever told them, nobody at their company, nobody around them had ever told them this business sucks. And it was kind of obvious the business sucks because they had made no money and they were just burning <laughs> cash and they could not figure out how to get anyone to pay for this product. And like, nobody cares about this product. Nobody wants this product. The person who wants this product is somebody who's going to make money because yes. they can see things faster or trade faster or whatever. Who is that? That is a trading firm. That is an yeah. MEV searcher. That is all these, th th this whole universe is exactly what needs your product and you have not spoken to any of them ever. And so that ended up being the pivot point for this company that led them into a totally different place in the ecosystem now. Now Blockrout is one of these companies that anybody who is trading on chain or who is interacting with MEV has to use Blockrout. Whether it's on Solana, wow. whether it's on Ethereum, whether it's on you know uh, Polygon or BNB chain, uh, everybody wow. who uses any of this stuff, they use Blockrout as the fastest way to read and write to the mempool, right? So you think about you know the fiber optic cables that uh, you know, HFT firms use in order to read and write from the exchange as fast as possible. That now is in crypto, it's blocked route. Um, and so that, that's the, the one example that comes to mind for me, because of course, I'm very close to the company being on the board of a place where it's this very obvious thing that, you know, anybody around, you know, every single investor, I guarantee you who passed on the company, and there are many investors who passed on that company, uh, could see this is a bad business. Your customer, yeah. your idea of who's going to pay for your product is nonsense. Um, but Nobody ever quite said that. I mean, they might have said, oh, you know, it's not quite for us. I think the revenue isn't really there, whatever. But nobody ever just told them, look, you have the wrong customer. Nobody who you're talking to is ever going to pay for your product. Um, and uh, again, I, I think this is the superpower that you have as an investor is you can just tell the truth. You can just say right. what you think. And you're not always right as an investor. And I think it's important to have some humility when you're sitting down talking to a founder. And there are many times that I've gotten that wrong. And I said, hey, you know, I don't think this thing is going to work. And the founder ends up proving me wrong and building a multi-billion dollar business. Um, <laughs> and that those are the biggest, you know, teachable moments for you as yeah. an investor is when you get it wrong. Um, but still, I believe that it is your job as an investor to say what you think. And if you're wrong, yeah. to be wrong and to learn from being wrong. Right. Well, I mean, you're still the whole the whole like definition of advice is um, 
it's not an it's not a mandate or an instruction. It's an option. And right. being able to say your opinion and give advice in a way where they can actually consider it is what I think what you're saying. Um, mm. But that, like you said, sometimes they don't take it, and that's that's what makes them a CEO, actually, right? So it's uh, everyone right. comments. Everyone, I do know a lot of people that they, they, they complain, oh, I gave this advice and they wouldn't take my advice. And so they're stupid. I'm like, oh, well, that's that's their job is to decide whose 100%. advice to take. You know, yeah. you know, whenever you're giving advice, you know, the whole idea, especially if it's unsolicited, but solicited advice is still just optional. And it does yeah. help. Like you may have told that person, hey, don't do this, do this. And then he had to get conviction on the, the anti hesley direction. And he had to say like, okay, well, I got to go against what this VC is saying. It seems, you know, round, and I'm still going to do it anyways. So, I would argue that you've still added value with that advice because you know you you have to think about it. The one thing I like to say is that uh, the thing that's scarcest that I think produces both great founders and great investors is stubbornness. Uh, yes, stubbornness. I like the word stubbornness, even though it's uh, obviously a negative word on its face. But being stubborn is very difficult. It's very difficult yeah. to hold on to an idea and say, no, 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 no. I know the market's telling me no. I know the investors are telling me no, but they're wrong. I'm right. I know what has to happen uh, and I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to force it to happen. Um, right. Whether it's Vitalik, when everybody around him told him that it's impossible to create smart contracts, you know, you can't, we've tried it before, we've all examined it, it's impossible, it's, you know, Turing completeness is, is, a, is, a, is a fool's errand. All the Bitcoiners, all the experts were telling him, you can't do this, this is not possible. And he was like, I don't agree with you. I'm going to, you know what, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to do it anyway, and I'm, I'm going to force it to happen because I think it should. Right. Or whether it's Rune from MakerDAO, who everybody at that time said, oh, you know, stable coins, decentralized stable coins that can never work. You know, look at BitShares, look at all this other stuff that's been tried. It all broke. There's no way this can work. Uh, and he said, no, 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 no. I really believe that there's a better way to do it. And I think you're all wrong. Yes. And that kind of stubbornness is rare. And it's where these great innovations fundamentally come from. Um, and I think in investors, the same is true is that now obviously you can be stubborn and stick to an investment that's failing, lose a bunch of money, um, you know, make it, have a bad thesis that you drive, you, 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 you drive with that thesis into the ground. And so there is a, an obvious sense in which there's a safety in following consensus, in abandoning right. narratives that aren't working out. Um, and as a VC, you'll do fine. If you, you know, get, if you let go of everything the market disagrees with, if you follow, uh, if you follow the narrative and you follow the zeitgeist, you will, you'll probably be, have a safe career doing well as a VC. But the very best VCs are the ones that are stubborn. And they say, you know what? No, 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 the market's wrong. Yeah, maybe this company didn't work, but, because, but this was just the wrong company to instantiate this thesis. Or maybe this company yeah. is going to work and nobody else sees it yet, but I see it. And those VCs, you know, if you think about Multicoin holding Solana, yeah throughout the bear market, all the way, you know, when Solana went down from $200 all the way down to eight bucks at the bottom and holding it yeah. all the way through and saying every single quarter, no, 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 no. I still believe Solana is going to be the one true winner and it's going to absolutely change the game about blockchains. Uh, that kind of stubbornness is incredibly difficult. It's incredibly yeah. rare, but it's also where the best returns come from is, right. you know, there, there's, a, there's a very simple matrix to understand you know, the investing landscape or where money can get made in investing, right? So there's mm -hmm. consensus and non-consensus, then there's right and there's wrong. And consensus right, meaning that everybody knows what the answer is, you also know what the answer is, and you stay safely within the majority, um, you will yes. make money. And it's, it's, it's fine, it's a good return, right? You sort of get the right to participate in the thing that everyone knows is gonna win. Um, and you can do okay, but you know, you're not going to make amazing returns, but you'll make good returns. Um, then there's uh, consensus wrong. So this is, you know, everybody thinks that OpenSea at 13 billion is going to be a great investment. Uh, and, you know, you pile in and everyone's piling in and it turns out we're all wrong, but nobody individually gets punished for making right. that mistake, right? Like sort of the industry kind of looks a little stupid because we all, you know, yeah. invested in OpenSea at this crazy valuation, uh, but fundamentally it's safe to do. Right, you're not going to lose your career because you invested OpenSea at 13 billion. Uh, you might not have good returns, but whatever. Nobody had good returns in that vintage, so 
you can you can pat yourself on the back. Um, now then, there's non-consensus wrong. So this is you know I think that uh, you know the, the Dow infrastructure is going to be the most valuable thing in the world. I'm going to pour all my entire fund into Dow infrastructure, and it turns out Dow's kind of a niche thesis even within crypto, and turned out nope didn't work. Exactly. DAOs did not become the future of, you know, corporate innovation and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and so you just lost your shirt and you look like a moron. And that is very painful. It's very scary. It's the kind of thing that will really make your LPs question you and people in the industry question you and say, yeah. what were you thinking? Why did you put all your money in this thing? Why were you rah rah this thing all the way into the ground? Um, and then, of course, there is non-consensus right. And non-consensus right is where almost all the money gets made. It's where almost all the greatest investments are, whether it was you know, the people investing in DeFi in 2018, 2019, uh, yeah. whether it's you know, investing into you know, the Solana or the AVAXs of the world at a time when you know, this Alt-L1 thesis didn't, need, you know, the term Alt-L1 didn't even exist at that time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's investing in Coinbase in, in uh, 20, 2016, 2015, before Bitcoin yeah. really took off in 2017. Um, it, these are the investments that end up defining a generation, that end up defining a vintage, that end up yeah. really changing the landscape. And those are the ones that end up returning your fund 3x, 4x, 5x over. Um, so, you know, it, whether it's, uh, you know, for us, for example, investing into Athena at a time when, yes. you know, right after Luna had collapsed and stable coins were a dirty word, DeFi was in the toilet. Nobody wanted to talk about DeFi at that time. Yeah. Um, and nevertheless, we believe that what Athena was doing was so novel and so important and fundamentally was needed that we end up investing. Um, and, you know, we invested, uh, there's now a multi-billion dollar uh, token. We invested at a $40 million valuation in the seed round. Yep. Um, and those, those types of deals are the deals that end up defining a vintage. Um, and so that's why it is so important as a VC to be stubborn because that stubbornness is what will allow you to invest in something at a time when everybody else is telling you, that is absolutely stupid. Why are you doing that? Don't do that. Um, right. That's the only way you can really become, I think, uh, a great investor is through allowing yourself to make really dramatic mistakes. Because without making dramatic mistakes, there's no way that you are going to find something that nobody else is able to find. Right. You almost have to, you have to have conviction in at least a few um, non, it's, it's, I guess you're basically just really investing into the non-consensus theme, themes. Right. And then you have to exactly. hope that your number of rights are more than other people's. Exactly. Uh, how, and that's how the reason you why your, your portfolio, like, are you, what percentage of your investments, like say the last 12 months have been consensus mm -hmm. versus not, we don't know if they're right or wrong. Cause it's only been the last year. Yeah. Well, Athena's last year. So maybe you have one example, right. but, um, right. how many of the ones in the last kind of six months are consensus where you like, there's, it's a, it's a trend and you need to be on that trend because mm. it's going to be a winner. And how many are non-consensus? Yeah. Good question. Um, Without having enough granularity of seeing the companies in front of me, I would guess it's probably pretty close to 50-50, um, okay. maybe slightly more non-consensus than consensus. Um, okay. we, we tend to, if you think about, okay, what's been consensus over the last six months to a year, I would say um, L2s, Bitcoin L2s mm -hmm. were consensus. I mean, they may, they may have fallen off a little bit lately, but... You know, they were d definitely within the safety of consensus. A lot of crypto AI stuff, I think, has been very, very consensus. That's what everybody has been piling, piling, piling into. Um, yep. A lot of these alternative, um, you know, SVM-based layer twos that seem to be popping up everywhere. Um, and I'd say for both those three things, we didn't really do much uh, or if, if anything at all. So okay. in that sense, we avoided kind of most of the, uh, most of the gravitational center of where consensus has been on the investing side um, mm -hmm. for, for the last few months. Um, that being said, you know, there are certain deals that we did that I think were very, very competitive deals that everybody was trying to get into. Um, and so in that sense, those deals can be for example, seen as consensus. So one example that was recently announced is Mega ETH. Um, okay. So this is a, uh, uh, you know, an EVM based layer two that was a very, very competitive deal. You know, everybody, uh, many, many people were trying to uh, get into this deal. Um, I think what they're doing is quite novel and quite different. Um, but uh, I would say this was consensus in the narrow sense of it was a very competitive deal. Um, mm -hmm. But sort of non-consensus in that it didn't really fit very neatly into any of the themes that 
yeah. investors are generally tripping over themselves to get into. Well, I think with you, it'd be, it would be hard to, I don't know if you can define competitive deal to be not, uh, to be, to make it consensus because once you mm -hmm. decide to invest like a dragonfly or, um, a Sequoia or one of these big names uh, out there, once one of you is going to invest, then everybody mm -hmm. that didn't see it before wants to be in that deal, you know, so it, that is it, it be it becomes consensus once someone knows that once the founder told someone else, Hey, Hasib's going to invest. They're like, Oh, I want to come in. Right, so I think right. you still get the credit so that, for not consensus. That does, that does happen. That does happen sometimes. But uh, okay, so I, I will say this deal that I'm referring to uh, was a deal that they'd already had a couple of term sheets. Actually, no, okay. they had one term sheet, I, I believe at the time yeah. that we, that we came in, but I, I wouldn't say it was because of us that this deal started getting bid up. Um, hmm. There are many deals that are like that, that, People okay. don't really understand what's going on. They don't really see the vision. And then once Dragonfly puts their stamp of like, hey, we want this, then all of a sudden people are like, oh, yeah, I, want you. I like this too. And I'm going to start. So that does happen. And it's, it's an interesting moment in the development of a fund when you notice that has started happening. So, you know, when Dragonfly started, we were nobodies. Nobody had any idea who we were. People thought we were some random fund that came out of Asia or something. And, uh, you know, people were like, well, why, why, why would I want your money? Who are you guys? And we had to scrimp and scrape for every deal that we got into in our fund one and, you know, the first few years of Dragonfly. And so I, I noticed it's very visceral when it happens that all of a sudden you go from being, uh, having to justify your place in the cap table to your existence on the cap table uh, attracting other people. <laughs> uh, that that transformation, it's a very weird one because you go all of a sudden from like having to sell yourself to the founder using you to sell themselves. Uh, that right. it's 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 a pretty um, stark transition, and we've we've right. we're now safely on the other side of that chasm. Um, but uh, it's it's really powerful. But it it it's it's one of these things that like you can't allow it to let you get lazy and let it convince yourself that you're right just because other people assume you're right, mm. right? So you're absolutely mm -hmm. right. There are a lot of VCs who, when they see Dragonfly invest in a deal, they're like, wow, Dragonfly must've done the work. Dragonfly, they're, they're so smart, they're so capable, they're tastemakers, whatever. So probably whatever they are seeing, I should you know, just follow it. Um, and uh, it's, it's very, very tempting to think like, oh, we, we are tastemakers and we do uh, know something very deep about these things. And the answer is that like, no, 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 no. You can't fall for your own bullshit. Like you well, have so to the always Sequoia, the story of Sequoia <laughs> and FTX, right? Exactly. Exactly. Like you have to always be disciplined and careful in your process because you know, you are the easiest person to fool. And that's why you must be very careful not to fool yourself about what you know, what you don't know, and about what your process has actually unveiled about this company or about this person. And so that's why, you know, with me internally at Dragonfly, um, especially with the, the, the junior team and, and you know, newer folks who've come into Dragonfly, um, they sort of see, and, and many people tell them this idea that, you know, if you're a great VC, when you invest in something, you make it successful just by virtue of the fact that everybody now converges on this thing. They think that it's really high signal. They think that it's really great. It attracts capital. It attracts partners. Um, and there's some effect of that. You know, it's not non-existent, but it's, it's actually quite small and it's smaller than most people think it is, even smaller right. than most VCs think it is. And as a result, most of what matters is simply, did you pick the right idea? Did you pick the right founder? And if you're and wrong about that, doesn't matter how cool you are. It doesn't matter if you're Dragonfly or A16Z or whoever. If you pick the wrong founder, it's going to fail. If you pick the right founder, it's going to succeed. What is your, what is your actual process? Like a, if you were to describe, you know, who's the investment committee? Is it you just you or is it you and 10 people? No, um, no. And then when you choose one, you know, and, and how much freedom does your new, you know, junior VCs have to make, you know, to make a conviction call and like, and, you know, is there situations that where someone can override, like, you know, they bring it mm -hmm. to you and you say, this is a stupid idea and you're, and you're, you know, it's a new, it's a new VC on the team. And he's like, oh no, we're going to do this. Like, what is, how does your decision making happen at Dragonfly? Yeah. So we have four partners at Dragonfly. Um, all four partners have a vote in our investment committee and majority rules about how a uh so you need three to get a deal through. done correct you need three to get a deal done so even if somebody disagrees okay. with you you can get the deal done um that being said it's very rare that we have a situation that's that uh, stark usually we get to consensus uh, but even if we don't a deal can get done 
Uh, now, anybody on the investment team can sponsor a deal at Dragonfly. Um, you don't need to get a partner or somebody else to get on board. Now, if the deal is sufficiently big uh, or if it's sufficiently competitive, you are going to need a partner just by nature of it's much harder to get a deal done of that size if you're a, a junior. Um, but in principle, anybody can bring a deal to IC. Um, and uh, the, in, the way that we structure IC is that IC is completely open. So anybody at Dragonfly can observe IC and even participate in IC and give their perspective and share their thoughts. So whether you're a lawyer, whether you're on the finance team, whether you're doing something completely different, um, we, our idea is that uh, the investment committee is a place where we surface the best ideas that we want to invest into. And anybody at the table, whether they're a junior VC or whether they're you know, somebody on legal or regulatory that has a perspective that can help us arrive at the truth, mm -hmm. they're welcome. Because fundamentally yeah. what we are trying to do is arrive at the right answer of, is this thing going to be where the future of crypto is going or not? Uh, and so that's how we think and make decisions. Uh, we try to yep. be a relatively flat organization. Um, although, okay. you know, naturally there's going to be some hierarchy when you have, you know, almost 50 people, but so, uh, wait, we try to every, flatten as can much bring as we something, can. If anyone can bring something to Anybody IC, in the investment you know, team. Investment team. Okay, so there's maybe 10 people on the investment team, including the four of you. Yeah. Correct. And they just say, hey, there's a deal coming. I want to bring it next Thursday. That's it. They can yeah. do it. They write a memo okay. and they, they present it. I see. We read through the memo together and then we discuss it. Okay. So let's let's go into into the future of, of your deals. Cause um I'd say, well, mm -hmm. first question is what percentage of your deals are token related? Is it a hundred percent? Or how many are equity deals no, that no. are not token related? Or is fifty fifty? Uh, historically it? it's been roughly fifty fifty between you know traditional startup equity and then um you know, token-based investments that usually when we invest in a token, we're investing into equity, but we expect that eventually we'll get a token and that will be yeah. the substantial value of what we invest right. into. So I guess a hundred percent of them have the potential of a token or sometimes no, no, they no. don't or no, no, no. What I'm saying is that 50, roughly 50% 50 of the companies we invest into, we expect to never have a token. Okay. Okay. So that's good. And, and I guess most of your, of your DPI has come from tokens so far. Um, is that true? Uh, a lot of the DPI has come from tokens, certainly not all of it. Um, mm -hmm. you know, a good amount of our DPI has come from selling companies in secondaries, uh, like equity yes. secondaries. So, yeah, yeah. uh, and then, um, what's been your best yeah. secondary equity deal? Uh, I don't know if I like can it. disclose that. Yeah, I don't know if I can disclose that. Um, or your favorite. Let's say favorite, so we don't know about <laughs> numbers. But like, what's your favorite? Um, my favorite secondary deal. Yeah, I think um, probably. I, I, unfortunately, it's unwise for me to uh, d disclose on behalf of a founder who we invested into that we sold their shares. So <laughs> I think I, I, I will dodge that question. I will gracefully dodge that. Oh, question. so but you're talking about secondary of the shares. Okay, not a not a sell of the company, but you've sold your shares to like a correct incoming VC. Correct. We sold our shares to another investor. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And this is common. This is a. Just for other people out there, it's a very common journey for shares in companies and whatnot. Right, um, right. Exactly. So I guess let's so talk especially about the given tokens. that. Oh, go, yeah, go ahead. Given that what? I was going to say, you know, given that, uh, especially under this SEC, it's been very difficult for crypto companies to go public. Um, yes. Naturally, the only way that as an investor, especially in our fund one, which was uh, twenty eighteen vintage, um, the only way you can actually get liquidity and start returning capital is through secondary transactions. So, yes. you know, when the market has been really good, um, so like in, you know, 2021, that was when we were monetizing a lot of our equity positions when there was a lot of demand for these equity, equity deals from a lot of traditional VCs or, you know, growth investors who are coming into the space. So that's how we yeah. generated DPI from some of those investments at a time, even when they couldn't go public. Oh, nice. Very interesting. <laughs> so I guess you've, you've become, I guess, um, how many token launches do you think that your firms had then so far? Must be over 100 over a hundred. So I guess from, I guess it would be interesting for viewers to hear what has, you know, what, what has seemed things, what is the magic, what is the magic uh, formula for getting a token live? I mean, cause obviously it's very tricky thing to go to liquidity. Mm -hmm. You know, there's all sorts of elements. Are you pre-product? Are you post-product? Are you, you know, are you, how are you choosing the valuation? Like, what, what is, how do you decide all that as a, like, cause you, this is probably where your VC-ness and your, your, your opinion 
is not only coming because you're a VC, but because you have 99 other deals. And this is probably the CEO's first, or if not second. Right. Um, right. What is the magic formula? So first thing, there is no magic formula. Uh, if you want to build something really great, chances are it's going to look different from the things that came before you. And you're going to have mm -hmm. to answer some fundamental questions about how your network or your protocol uh, is going to be distinct. That being said, uh, you know, when you're thinking about launching a token, the first thing <clears throat> that I've learned as an investor, especially when you're investing at the earliest stages, is that uh, you actually don't need that many answers uh, to some of these fundamental questions at the very beginning. And no. you know, when you're a junior investor, you often think that your job is to disambiguate or to you know, kind of uncover as many of these questions as possible, such as you know, how does a token capture value? What is the exact token mechanics? Uh, where is the blah, blah, blah going to happen? And what's the buyback and burn and the this and the that? And the thing that I've learned is that you don't need answers to any of those questions at the beginning. Mm -hmm. the, the, the questions you need to answer is what are you building? Why is it valuable? And yeah. why are you the right person to do it? And if you can answer those yeah. questions, then all the things in between of, okay, how do I structure this thing? How do I create a foundation? Uh, where do I incorporate it? Where do I put the IP? Blah, blah, blah. All that stuff you can figure out sitting down with a, an experienced VC, you know, somebody like ourselves or, you know, any of the crypto VCs who've done it a bunch of times to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just do mechanically the steps you need to do in order to construct a token, right? And then, you know, things like how many of the tokens are going to go toward the treasury? How many of them are going to go in your airdrop? How many, blah, blah, blah. A lot of junior VCs will be, well, I need this in order to present a memo in order to da 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 da, da and so they give me answers to these questions. It's like, no, no, it's okay. You can take time to think very carefully about these things when you're ready to actually make those commitments. Um, yeah. Right now, all I need to know is, you know, oh, what are you, are you building a stable coin? Are you building a layer two? Are you, do you have a novel idea? Do you have a great team? Do you have the DNA to do this right? What is your unique insight or unique perspective? Um, and, and so generally what I tell founders is, it's okay. You don't need to pre-commit to all these things up front. Um, it's actually better for you to make these decisions one at a time when you have later. the full information requisite to make these decisions. Um, so at the end of the day, the number one thing that you need, the magic formula to building a great token is fundamentally having insight. And early on in a company, all you should be doing is cultivating this insight and really leaning into it and making sure yeah. that you're sending off in the right direction. Um, like fundamentally, uh, the, the mental model I have or the analogy I like to use for founding a company is, you know, I imagine, you know, Christopher Columbus uh, sailing to India, right? Yeah. The most important thing is, is your ship set in the right direction? And do you have the right captain of the ship and enough food on, on board <laughs> yeah. to be able to make it yeah. to, and to the right land? crew And the right now crew. You, and the right crew, exactly. And now look, you might not make it to land and you might be totally wrong about what land you're going to. Um, and that's okay. Both of those situations are okay, right? But the yeah. fundamental thing is, first question to answer is, are we going toward new land? Because if we're not going through new land, none of these other questions matter. Of, of oh, well, what's the take rate for, you know, how much are you going to give to the French or the Spanish crown? And how much are you going to keep for yourself? Yeah, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. You know, what's the, uh, what's the business model? And what are you going to do? What are you even going to get when you get there? It's like, I don't fucking know. You know what, is, what, is, what is even in India? <laughs> Spices, maybe? You know, whatever. Gold? I don't know. Um, so I all these Chris questions Chris are pitching to, to Dragonfly right now. He's like, okay, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. I got this idea. And so <laughs> so at, at the end of the day, in the very beginning, all that matters is, are you going in the direction of land? And if you are yeah. going in the direction of land, are you even capable of making it there and making it back? Yeah. That's all we're trying to so answer. I guess I, that, that is a phen phen phenomenal, uh, phenomenal uh, insight and answer. Um, and I want, and I want to get to the next question, which is, Mm -hmm. Okay, you did invest in me. I'm Christopher Columbus. I'm in the boat. I've made it to the new world. I'm on my way back and I'm about to hit market. I'm about to come back to, um, to Spain. And right. now it's a real thing. And we're deciding mm -hmm. to make, you know, our, our Christopher Columbus ship liquid. So now, you know, obviously this is a, uh, a relevant week, you know, with July 4, you know, we had the crash July 5th, essentially, you know, we basically have a big drawback in the crypto markets. I think every token that launched this year is underwater, if I'm, hmm. if I think correctly, right? So like everyone came out to public market. So anyone that's bought a token on a public market is now negative in red. So, right. um, you know, I'm a VC, I'm Christopher Columbus in my Christopher token, and I'm, I've got Haseeb on board. You've been on my, you've hmm. been investing since I went out and found the new land. I'm back now. We're going to launch yep. the Christopher token tomorrow. 
like what is your advice to me about deciding the you know the the fully dil diluted valuation how much market float how much valuation let's say the last valuation was here um market's down you know 40 percent, but we still want to get liquidity or we still need to launch the token in some way like how mm. do you how do, what does that discussion look like um you know, I have my views and stuff like that. I would just love to hear some anecdotes from you about, you know, uh, founders that want to launch at a big up round since their last VC. Um, do you do flat rounds where it's the same as their last round? And do you do down rounds where you say like, hey, we're going to launch a token, but we're going to accept, you know, the Series C is going to get, you know, the last round, the pre-sale is going to get a hit, but we're still going to do yeah. it. Like, what are the nuance around that? So the answer, generally speaking, is that Okay, so what are you optimizing for as a founder when you when you float a token? So first thing is that you want people who buy this token early to make money. You want to make it so that your um, initial cohort of uh, owners who are, who are part owners in your network, um, that they're rewarded for being long-term holders. And on some level, yes. so you, what you want is a slow burn of price up and to the right, right? That is the yes. ideal outcome is that there's this gentle uh, appreciation of the asset. Um, the second thing you want is you want sufficient uh, float out there to really have price discovery um, and sufficient liquidity. So if there's not enough uh, for there to be price discovery, then you're going to end up having a lot of volatility and, and a, a failure of markets to really be able to, to float, clear like and find the true price. Or something. I think the, the range of float can be anywhere from like, let's say nine, 10% on the low side to like 15, 20% on the high side. Um, okay. I think outside those bounds uh, it starts getting either too little or too much but um i think anywhere in that neighborhood is generally pretty healthy for a uh you know day one token launch um i'd say the third thing that you care about is so naturally there are going to be unlocks that happen over time from the team unlocking because the team generally vests uh and the investors unlocking uh because the investors right. also vest and then, of course there are other things like grants and other partnerships that that may also have similar investing structures. Uh, so those yeah. tokens will eventually find their way onto the market. And those tokens, you want to make sure that the rate of change for the total supply of the token um, is relatively smooth and not super spiky, right? So you want to avoid these very sudden um, influxes of new tokens onto the market. And so, yes. you know, how, how can you accomplish that goal alongside those other two goals? And the answer is that you want to have enough supply out on day one, but you also want to have a relatively smooth function that determines when these tokens are vested and available for trading. So right. um, all of those things, what they point towards is that you want, you know, a, a moderately healthy amount of float on day one. Um, you want to make sure unlocks are smooth and not too lumpy or too spiky. Um, you want to make sure that there's enough float such that the amount of, uh, like the rate of change is relatively impact. Like the slope is pretty small. You don't want this massive, you know, charts going here, 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 boom. Um, you don't want that. Um, and, uh, and you want to make sure that there's enough, you know, kind of gentle price appreciation that's happening over time for people who are long-term holders. Um, mm. So that I think is most of what you're looking for. Wait, but you said you're for long-term holders, what about short-term? What about people that came in you know, let's say Hasib, you're a, a pre-seed investor, or or maybe you're a pre-sale investor. Do you guys do pre-sale investments mm. where it's just about to go live? Um, sometimes. Sometimes. So yeah, if that one goes live, you know, you invested in let's let's just make a hypothetical Christopher token. You know, mm. Christopher Columbus token is, let's say it's a fifty million dollar or a hundred million dollar valuation, and sure. then the market is uh, you're going to go live. Um, are you comfortable with that going out at a hundred or would you even, is there ever a situation where you did the round at a hundred and you're telling them to go live at 90 or so, 80 or 50? Yeah. So okay, the first thing to understand is that, um, so as, as a VC, I'm never going to tell a founder, here's the price at which you should float your token. Right. Cause the first thing to right. understand your token, floating a token is not like an IPO. You are not going and selling like you know, the, the price that they negotiate with me, uh, if I'm buying immediately before token generation, um, then that is effectively the closest thing that you, there could be to an IPO where you are actually selling yeah. uh, something to an institutional investor before the asset is going to go live yeah. for trading. But, right. but once the thing IPO convert effectively, right. And then once the thing actually goes on Binance, um, Binance doesn't set a price, right? It no. just starts trading. So 
uh, once it starts trading, it's just market forces that are going to decide what price this thing comes out at. So it's not the, the right way to understand it is that it's not the team setting a price. Um, okay. The right way to understand it is that it's more. I mean, it, if it's doing something like launch pool or one of these other things, and like yes, okay, there is some price, some reserve price that's effectively set for the token. Um, but mm -hmm. the 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 thing that ends up determining the price is more the the total supply that's going to be floated on day one. Because right. you know you can sort of model the you can model most tokens as having relatively inelastic demand, right? Meaning there's there's a certain amount of demand for this asset, and mm -hmm. uh, a certain amount of buying pressure that's going to be there. You know maybe it's a few hundred million dollars that would be willing to buy this asset, um, and that buying demand, generally speaking, is not super sensitive to price on day one, right? Meaning mm -hmm. that you know there's going to be about three hundred million dollars that are going to buy your token. And whether your token buys you, you know, 5% uh, of your network or 7% of your network or 10% of your network, um, maybe the, most of that buying volume is insensitive to what percentage of your network they're buying, right? As opposed right. to the percentage of the float that they're buying. Um, right. And that, uh, what that implies is that the way that you can impact price is primarily by the quantity that is going to be floated on day one, rather than you directly saying, hey, please trade this at 80 cents, right? I don't care right. what you tell me to trade it at. We're just going to trade it according to market forces. Um, so mm -hmm. that I think is the real lever that founders uh, primarily have if and when they can actually influence the total amount of float that's going to be there on day one. But I think, but, but don't, I mean, I mean, don't founders, don't CEOs with their market makers, you know, discuss price quite a bit and at least set some sort of target or some sort of like um, expectation. Um, no, they and, do. And, they do. And also so in, the, in the, the structures, right. So when they're talking to listing, listing generally has some expectations about where this thing roughly is going to end up floating. And of course, with your market making agreements, you're going to set some uh, initial ideas about where price is going to be. But both yeah. with listings and with market makers, there's always some understanding that there's uncertainty about where yeah. price is going to end up landing, right? And so these are things that are always going to be fluid with respect to what happens initially at listing or at price. And of course, these things are also influenced by pre-market trading. So nowadays you have you know, platforms like Avo or Hyperliquid that will do these pre-market trading, um, basically uh, uh, futures where people are betting on what the price of this ad token is gonna be once it goes live. And that ends up becoming right. informative to you know, market making agreements or to listing teams about where they expect this thing to end up landing. Uh, and that's gonna, that, that's gonna give them a lot more signal. But you know, back three, four years ago, we didn't have that. And so there was a lot more, um, there was a lot more looseness when people were coming up with ideas about where this thing is going to end up trading. Right. Right. Okay. So I guess, uh, so, so is, has there ever been a situation where you invested in a price and you recommended or the founder came back to you and listed it at a lower valuation than your last valuation? Has it ever happened? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. you know, that being said, and again, so we would never get into a situation with a founder where we would tell them what price to list a token at. Yeah, I guess. That, um, yeah, exactly. I'm just saying like, has it happened? I guess it's happened. Yeah, sometimes. no, it's absolutely happened that, that, you know, somebody raised at a high valuation, they listed a lower valuation. Um, and then sometimes the exchanges will, especially if you're doing like a launch pool or launch pad type thing, um, or a coinless yeah. sale or one of these things, like th these things, it's, it's quite common actually that you will do these at a lower price than the last venture round in large part because yeah. very intentionally you're designing this so that the retail investors who are participating in this launch pad or launch pool type program are supposed to make money. Exactly. Yeah. So um, you will, you will systematically underprice it for this cohort of investors. Um, but right. it just sometimes happens that, you know, you invest in uh, uh, an up market comes in a down market mm -hmm. or, you know, this token doesn't have the credibility that maybe people uh, initially believed that it had or wanted it to have. Um, yep, so yep. yeah, absolutely happens sometimes, but it's um, ideally if you're doing your job, well, it's not the norm. No. And how important are the market makers in this space? Like, are they, they, they are, are good for the space, bad for the space? Do you love them? Do you hate them? What is your take on the market maker world? I mean, they're, they're, they're fine. Uh, I've, <laughs> I've nothing in principle against market makers. Market makers, obviously their job is to make markets more liquid. In doing yeah. that, they provide a valuable service. So, you know, anybody who's getting their token listed on a tier one exchange, there are going to be other market makers who are helping to uh, buoy that token, make it liquid and make markets smooth and orderly. Um, that being said, uh, you know, market makers are not fundamental to the market, right? Even in, in, when, when, uh, when FTX collapsed, you saw a lot of market makers 
kind of disappeared or they, they, you know, capital markets became really, really thin and liquidity decreased dramatically after the collapse of FTX just because of how many market makers yep. got hurt and had reduced inventory and reduced yep. ability to borrow and to, to have cash on the balance sheet to, to continue making markets. And so that, that caused um, the exit of a lot of market makers from the market. And we saw the effect yeah. of that, which was that markets were less liquid. There was uh, worse price discovery. There's a lot more volatility in the markets. Um, and that's bad. Is yeah. it existential? No. Market makers are nice. They provide a valuable service. Um, but even in the absence of market makers, crypto would operate fine. It would just be more volatile and less liquid. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess the uh, uh, kind of in vogue these days has been like, um, I would call them PIPTI or like uh, private investments in in or in like live tokens. Like, um, mm -hmm. I guess there's a Solana deal. There's some rumors of Ton deal. Um, where right. they selling very locked up tokens at 40% discount. Are you guys investing in that type of stuff or do you bring those kind of things to your LPs? How do you, what do you think of those types of deals these days? They're so essentially we have um, in um, primary fundraisers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so very often the, you know, the foundation or the team, um, you know, they have a lot of tokens and those tokens may have vested, uh, but they don't necessarily want to sell those tokens directly on the primary market because that's going to spook, um, you know, people, everyone could see on chain that, okay, these are the, your assets. Um, and so very often they will want those tokens to continue to be locked up and held with long-term investors. Uh, and that's their motivation for going basically OTC and yeah. selling this to selling this in size to, you know, a smaller cohort of investors who are aligned with the token mm -hmm. or the ecosystem. Um, and so we've, we've done several of these type of investments and, I think they're a place where, again, VCs can continue adding value to a project even post token launch because of the fact so that they do, are. So you do several of those deals. So you like those deals. Oh, yeah. I'm at a 40 yeah. to 60 percent. I mean, we don't do them all the time, but yeah, we don't do them yeah. all the time. But they're it's something that we have conviction in that we want to double down in. Absolutely, we will. Okay. A lot of them are the same deals you're already in, or are they sometimes. Uh, most of them are. Most of them are. Okay. So it's like, okay, we love this team. They're live. The token has been drawn back. We can get even 40% more discount. Let's do that deal. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Interesting. So you can think of it as just effectively a follow on. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially. Essentially. What do you, what do you see is the future um, for the industry? Like what is like, uh, what's next for Bitcoin blockchain and the, you know, the, the universe of what we're, of, of what you're doing. That is a, like that five is a years out, question. What, what does this all look like? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, one thing that's clear as we're going into a very different political environment is that crypto is now on the world stage and it has a, a legitimacy and a ubiquity that it did not have before. And I think we're going to see over the next five years that's going to play out and that in some level, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies generally are going to become more mundane. They're, they're just going to become accepted into, you know, part of the fabric of society in the same way that, yeah. um, you know, using an iPhone. Uh, for work, uh, you know, it used to be kind of weird, right? Was, using you're using a, a smartphone for work applications, like all of a sudden now it's just completely normal. You would never think twice about uh, an iPhone being something you'd use at work. Um, when the iPhone was first released, it was thought of as like a toy, like a weird little gadget that you know is you know, yeah. but you use a BlackBerry or something like that at work. Um, alternatively, you know, maybe a maybe a more concrete example is gaming. Gaming used to be something thought of as very nerdy and kind of you know weird and. Now gaming is ubiquitous, right? There's billions of people who play games and it's bigger than, bigger than uh, any other entertainment industry. It's bigger than movies, bigger than music. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, massively, massively large industry. And I think the same thing will uh, come true of crypto that people will just acknowledge crypto is a big industry. It's here to stay. And um, it's become rather ubiquitous within the world um, to the point where it's no longer weird, right? So if you think about it, Bitcoin today is 16 years old. 16. Okay. Um, most people who are in college today do not remember a time before Bitcoin existed. And wow. you're going to see um, as this generation, you know, my generation and the generation after me and the generation after them, uh, when they come into their prime earning years, they are not going to remember a time before crypto. To them, crypto is going to be totally normal and, a, and a, yeah. uh, something that they remember ever since they had money that they were investing into and they try and they, and they treat it as an investable asset class. And so I mm -hmm. think so much of what's going to happen, that's going to end up empowering digital assets is the fact that to young people today, the fact that you're going to denominate wealth and save, um, 
and uh, you know, instead of in gold, which is this shiny rock that's painstakingly drilled out of the earth, uh, being the way in which we denominate wealth and value, that instead it's going to be something that's purely digital, that is provably scarce, cryptographically enforced, um, and has been around for as long as they can remember. That mm -hmm. to them, I think, is going to be absolutely obvious in a way that it is not to people who are currently in their uh, 30s and 40s and in their prime working years and, and at a time when they've accumulated most of the wealth and most of the capital. So there's going to be a natural changing of the guard. And that to me is the most obvious, you know, so you can look at markets and say, oh, markets are down now, they're up here, you know, oh, Mount Gox and this thing and interest rates and blah, blah, blah. And all these things matter and they're going to end up affecting markets. The nice thing about being a VC is that as I'm not a trader, doesn't matter to me what the price is today or tomorrow. The question is, what are the prices going to be at the time when I exit these positions? Yes. And the time when I exit these positions is in, you know, three, four, five, six, seven years. And but don't you guys the hold only question that matters? Of course, but we hold them for a long time, right? We have these long lockups, um, and uh, we don't yeah. vest all of our tokens in a year. You know, it takes uh, many years for us to get all of our tokens. And so as a result, yeah. like, you know, in, we invested into Monad, for example. It's a new layer one. It's very hot. Um, if you look at Monad, like we invested in Monad in 22. And uh, it is now, you know, it's 2024. They still have not launched their token. They probably won't this year. Um, and, uh, you know, by the time they launch their token, it'll be a one-year cliff before we get any of our tokens. And then four years end to end for us to get all of our tokens, which means it doesn't matter what prices are today. What matters is yeah. what are prices going to look like in two years, three years, four years, five years? And yeah. the answer of that has nothing to do with interest rates, has nothing to do yeah. with whether Germany or uh, German government or Mt. Gox or any of these things. Like, yeah, th that will happen. It'll spook markets. And then, you know, people will buy the tokens and, you know, prices will go back to whatever their fair value is. Um, and fundamentally, the thing that matters is where is the trend line going? Where is this stuff going in the long term? That is the only thing as a VC that I have to underwrite. And so where, where is it going? I mean, and, and add to that question, how does it work with you? You're obviously an American uh, mm -hmm. VC. You're in Silicon Valley. And yep. I'm guessing most of your investments are not in the United States, or if they are, the tokens are launching, you know, the, the foundations are on the US. How does it work for you? Um, like, and, and how will things change in the next kind of 24 months as you see them? That's a good question. I, I do think the U.S. has been relatively inhospitable to digital assets over the last few years. And yeah. I think we're starting to see a temperature shift within the U.S. You see very yeah. clearly that Biden has realized that now crypto is going to be a campaign issue in a way that yep. in 2020 it was not. And that is galvanizing uh, a lot of political activity around crypto. We now see that the, uh, the crypto PAC is the, one of the five largest PACs in the U.S., just by amount of capital, nice. the the amount of uh, political organization in crypto is dramatically bigger than what it was four years ago, and that's yep. causing this uh, this sentiment shift from both the White House as well as from Congress about how important digital assets are and how important it is to get this right if you want to yep. win the approval of voters going into this upcoming election. So I think what we're yep. going to see is that over the next four years, now obviously if Trump wins, Trump has positioned himself as being very, very pro-crypto, and I think, and yep. also generally dismantling a lot of the administrative state, which I think will end up clearing a lot of the, um, uh, the obstacles to crypto adoption yep. in the US. But even if we see another democratic uh, administration, it will almost certainly be softer on crypto than uh, we've seen over the last few years in the collapse since the collapse of FTX. So I think we're in for a very good four years, and I think it's going to cause a lot of capital to come back to the U.S. and a lot of founders to stay within the U.S. when they're building products. And yep. uh, I suspect that we will also see um, a, a, a legislative regime and a regulatory regime finally get articulated within the U.S. within the next few years. Um, and I think that will also be very good for the space. So uh, in, in a way, this is the U.S. playing catch up. Right. You yep. already see this in Singapore, in Hong Kong, in Dubai, in, you know, in Japan and Korea. These places already have robust regulatory regimes that welcome Web3 and digital assets and, and want these founders to be there to build stuff. The U.S. is the odd duck out that is basically telling people, screw you, get the hell out of my sight, uh, you know, do this somewhere else. And I think that yeah, totally is right. not going to I think that's, that's not going to persist. That's not going to resist. It's going to take time. It's going to take work. Um, and it's not by default that that will change. 
But I do believe that with the amount of organization and political activation, that will change in the next few years. Right, right. And and next few years, like what is the let's go let's leave the administrative side. Like of, I think I think I could agree that especially if Trump is elected, or even if Trump is not, there's going to be some pro crypto elements to this, you know, next cycle where the U.S. does have potential to become a center again or to become mm -hmm. at least very important. Um, what is the like, what is the future vision? Like, what is the blockchain crypto? And like, if you were to say how important is Bitcoin in five years, how important is crypto? Mm -hmm. Like, what is it the biggest impact to the to the human or to the world going to be from the, the all these companies you've invested in and, and the, the companies that you like that you haven't invested in? What is it? What does that look like? What's the five and ten year? horizon for what we're doing. So it's always difficult to project that far out with a disruptive technology because mm -hmm. the whole point of a disruptive technology is that it creates nonlinearities and those nonlinearities are very difficult to predict ex ante, right? If you, if you had told me in 2018, when we were investing into, you know, the, the, the first green shoots of DeFi, that DeFi would eventually create what it is today, this, you know, $150 billion plus ecosystem of you know, all these uh, instantaneous things that you can compose together like Lego blocks to build, you know, um, instantaneous on-chain futures and derivatives and blah, 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 blah. Um, I would have had no idea what you were talking about. And all this, like, well, it's just a cool way. You, instead of using Binance, you can trade on Ether Delta. Or you can trade on Uniswap. Mm -hmm. It was just a cool idea. It's a cool little thing you could do, right? And the the consequences of that are very, very difficult to anticipate, right? In the same way, yeah. you know, if you think about the mobile phone, or right, the, the smartphone. It's very difficult to figure out how from the idea that you could access the internet on a mobile phone means that eventually someday there's going to be no more taxi cabs in LA. It's like, how, how, yeah. how would you have seen for, from Uber, yes. from Uber and Lyft, yeah. right? Like, how would you have seen that that was going to cause that? And the answer is that you can't. Right. Every disruptive technology creates these nonlinearities that are very, very difficult for people to predict. Yeah. So if you think about, you know, NFTs or meme coins or all the stuff that's arisen from the result of Vitalik Buterin deciding one day that I should allow Bitcoin to become fully programmable mm -hmm. in creating Ethereum. Right. These kinds of things are, are so um, unpredictable that um, it's so on one level, I would say that uh, it's somewhat of a fool's errand to predict what's going to happen. But the w one thing that I, that I will say that I do have confidence are going to happen. One is that more and more of the world's wealth is going to be stored in Bitcoin rather than in gold right. and other traditional forms of, of stores of value. Um, the second thing is that we're going to see stable coins become one of the most dominant means of payment around the world that will allow anybody anywhere, as long as they have a mobile phone, to be able to pay each other instantaneously with almost no fees. And that is going to be a massive stable disruption. Stable coins become super, super important. Absolutely. I mean, they already are, right? Yeah, you, see, you already see yeah, yeah. today that stable coins are. I'm a bit of a stable coin centers. maximalist. I, I'm right there with you. Right there with you. Yeah. Um, so that's another and thing. I, and that I, I, I also, I also think that the, I also think that the, the, the laws that they're going towards with stable coins are actually going to be so disruptive because they think that they're taking advantage of the stable coins by forcing them to be 100% backed and to own treasuries. Those are going to create a situation where the banks have no attractiveness anymore. Mm. Right. Like regular money right. in a bank. Why would I have it there if I know that I have a hundred percent backed stable coin or a, a yeah. three percent backed coin dollar in my local bank, where I have a bearer asset that is a hundred percent backed and own, and essentially is backed by treasuries? Right. What is the reason to have a bank account? Absolutely, absolutely. And of course, a lot of so, the demand for stable coins is not domestic. Right. A lot of the demand for no. stable coins is international. It's people outside the US who don't even have access to the 3% reserve bank account anyway. Right. Right? They, they can't get yeah. dollar banking or dollar denominated uh, savings except through stable coins. And so I yep. think you know, the, 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 the loose way that I like to analogize it is that you know, what the internet did, the crypto will do to finance and money what the internet did to every other industry. If you think about yeah. all the industries that have been completely transformed by the internet, but somehow finance and money is almost exactly the same, right? Like yeah. I, the, the only difference now is I can, I can visit my bank account on my phone and, you know, see some numbers. Um, but that's about it. There's not that yeah. much else that's fundamentally changed. And whenever anything goes wrong, I still have to go into a bank branch. 
and goes like, oh yes. hi it's me you know yeah messi please give me my money back <laughs> um and that that is what crypto portends to change and it will change there's absolutely no way that the way that we did money 50 years ago is the way that we are going to do money 50 years from now and right crypto and you know complete digitization and programmability of money is the fundamental way that that is going to happen and if you talk about yeah. you know ai the rise of on-chain agents uh and fully yeah. autonomous um uh, uh fully autonomous ai agents i think they are almost certainly going to use a form of money to interact with each other and to interact with us and very yeah, likely that money is going to be crypto has to be crypto right because you know an ai can't over bitcoin account. yeah yeah, I mean, well, AI doesn't have an EIN, right? They can't pay taxes. They can't, you know, how are they going to pass KYC? The, the, the legal world is not designed for non-human APIs. Um, yeah. But you know, AI is going to race way ahead of any of that, right? We have no idea how we're going to tax AIs when AIs start engaging in commerce. Um, but oh, wow. they know how to use a private key. They know how to sign transactions. I mean, in, in a way, your crypto money was designed for machines. And as a result, it inevitably is going to play a very, very large role in where technology is taking us. Yeah, I guess everyone talks about the robot future, but it might be like it's really the investment bankers that are robots in the future. You know, bigger impact than robots, you know, making you a sandwich. It's like very the possible. commerce, you know, the the entrepreneurial future of, of, of robots could be crazy. Right. Totally agreed. Totally and agreed. do you think do you think that um, and, and I guess uh like, uh, how, how much of a Bitcoin are you? Are like, do you, is Bitcoin different than everything else? Is Bitcoin the same? Is Bitcoin important? You said that you're not doing Bitcoin layer two, like, um, how, um, how much does Bitcoin play into your futurist thinking? So Bitcoin, I, I think Bitcoin at this point is fairly well understood as an investment asset, right? So it is a, um, it's a replacement for digital gold. It's very unlikely to be a means of payment or to fulfill some of these other roles at this point. I think it's been typecast and it plays yeah. that role very, very well. Um, yep. But I don't think Bitcoin is the whole story. I don't think Bitcoin could supplant everything that, that people are doing with respect to you know, DeFi and entertainment and stable coins and all these things. DeFi is the wrong substrate for that. Or sorry, Bitcoin is the wrong substrate for that. Um, but right. Bitcoin, I think it has is, it is figured out who it is. And it's going to play that role very, very well. And I think it's going to continue to appreciate going into the next decade. Okay. Wow. So then I think that, I think we, uh, hold on. This has been very, very fascinating and very fun. Um, I think we just have to do it again sometime in the future, maybe uh, in six, 12, maybe 12 months or so. But um, absolutely, this has been super valuable for me. And uh, I think for the, the readers, I have uh, another few questions I'd love to ask you, but I'm, I'm going to, we'll put those off for next time because it's better to, it's better to have something to look forward to. Um, sounds great. So thank you very, thank you very much for your, your time. And, um, man, it's been, it's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Really fun conversation. This is, uh, Hasib from, uh, Dragonfly on, uh, Transform. Oh, my God.